first reading this morning is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 115, verses 1 through 18. Listen to the word of God. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens, for he does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the works of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their salvation, their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from his time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is also from the Old Testament, from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. We shall be reading the first 12 verses. It's on page 495 in your pew Bible. And again, let's listen to the word of God. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of this, his holy word. Well, we have all seen it and perhaps have even lived it a little bit. I'm talking about that phenomenon that happens when usually it's a teenager, when a teenager becomes obsessed with a certain singer or actor or athlete, and they start devoting all of their time and all of their energy, they start devoting themselves to that person. It happens all the time, and it's rarely a subtle thing when it happens. Usually, the young person will will start to dress like their new obsession. That's why in the 80s, you saw all kinds of teen girls dressing like Madonna or Cyndi Lauper, the boys dressing like Don Johnson or Philip Michael Thomas from Miami Vice. 
In the 90s, when I was in high school, we dressed like Kurt Cobain or Courtney Love. We had baggy pants, we had flannel shirts, we had Doc Martin boots. I could never afford them, I always wanted them. <laughs> Some of us had long hair. I was too chicken to gr grow mine out, but we looked good, let me tell you. <laughs> and often, they, they try to talk like the person they are obsessed with, to use the same words, the same slang, the same intonation and phrasing. And in the age of YouTube, when you can pull up all kinds of videos today, you can really study the person that you are obsessed with so you can talk the way that they do. If it's a sports star that they're obsessed with, well, of course, they'll wear their jersey or their numbers, and, and they'll memorize all their stats and their famous plays and all the times when the referee or the umpire robbed them and they should have won and this and that. In short, the young person will do everything they can to become like their new obsession. Because, and the word here is very important, because they idolize that person. Essentially, that person becomes an object of worship for them, becomes their idol. And we laugh it off. We say it's a harmless phase that they're going through, and quite often it is, but it shows that deep within every one of us is the capacity to make an idol out of almost anything. And for some adults, this idolatry continues, albeit in a more su uh, subtle and sophisticated form, into adulthood. And as we continue this sermon series on the Psalms, we see a principle laid down for us here in Psalm 115 that whether we are worshiping God or whether we are worshiping an idol, we will become like what we worship. And of course, Scripture teaches us that first and foremost, and indeed exclusively, we must worship the Lord. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name we give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Not to us, O Lord, but to your name be the glory. It reminds us of the first of the Ten Commandments where God tells us, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods but the one true God, the God of Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is God, and he will not share his glory or share his throne with anyone or anything else. In fact, it would be wrong for God to do so, since he is the creator and Lord of the universe. And that was a huge problem in ancient Israel where they struggled mightily with the exclusivity of this claim upon them. There were those in Israel, just as there are today, who really wanted much more freedom to craft their own religion and their own practice of religion. They wanted more freedom to mix and match different religious beliefs and practices, and they would rationalize this by saying, well, of course we are worshiping God, of course we are worshiping the Lord. We're going to the temple and doing our duty. It's just that we're also worshiping Ra of the Egyptians and Baal of the Philistines and Bel and Ishtar of the Babylonians and Moloch and Chemosh and all of these other gods, you know, just in case. To cover our bases. Or perhaps even worse, we're smushing together this practice from here and this practice from there and crafting a new kind of tailor-made religion just for me. 
we're practicing a syncretistic kind of religion where we're putting many different faiths and practices together. And as I said, human nature has not changed. You will still today see somebody who goes to church on Sunday, but on Monday they go to yoga, and on Tuesday they go and have their tarot cards read, and on Wednesday they burn some sage in a smudge pot because their aura needed some cleansing. You know, that happens sometimes, and we got to clean the house out. And on Thursday they got to great deal on some special crystals that are said to have this healing power, and they put all that together, this salad bar mentality when it comes to faith, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, toss it all together, and hey, presto, I've got a new belief system that's just for me, because in the end, that's what it's really all about, me feeling good, right? Me feeling fulfilled, and yet not to us, not to us, but to your name, O Lord, we give the glory. And this piggybacks on what we were talking about last week when we looked at Psalm 111 and we saw the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, worshiping God, having an awe and a reverence and a love for God, having a wonder before God, and God alone is the beginning, the starting point of a wise life. If you want to live life as it was meant to be lived, God says, with all of the fullness and the abundance that we are meant to have in our lives, that starts with having a proper attitude and posture towards God. It be begins with worshiping God as he calls us to worship, and he says we are to worship him alone. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, a man's God is that for which he lives, for which he is prepared to give his time and his energy and his money, that which stimulates him and rouses him and excites him and enthuses him. Think about your life. What is it that gets you excited? What is it you look forward to doing? What is it you look forward to spending time on? What is it you invest yourself in? You invest your energy, your time, your money. That is what you worship. That is what is most important to you. And that is why you will see your pastor get very frustrated sometimes when somebody shows a deep reluctance to spending time with the Lord, spending time in worship, but then is super excited to go down to the ballpark, super excited that we're going to go and spend the day on the lake fishing, super excited to go spend 80 hours a week at work making money, because what that person is telling me is who their God really is, and it's not Jesus Christ. They're showing you what excites them, what they dedicate themselves to, what they give their time and energy to, what they will dress up for, what they will spend their money on and their attention on. Now, I'm not saying we can't have hobbies. Of course we can. I'm not saying there shouldn't be other things that excite us about life. Of course there should be. We can have interests and pastimes and all of those things Art and sports and work, they're all good things. The thing is, when that good thing becomes your number one thing, when that good thing becomes your ultimate thing, the thing you give yourself to, then we've got an idolatry problem. Then that is your God. And Scripture tells us, God alone should be the only one who has that place in our lives. Not to us be the glory, not to football be the glory, not to fishing be the glory, not to sleeping in or family time or soccer practice or making lots of money or me, 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 me be the glory. 
but to God alone be the glory. He is the only one who truly is worthy of us investing our lives, our time, our energy, our enthusiasm, our loyalty, our money, ourselves in him. As the first question of the Westminster Shorter Catechism famously says, what is the chief end of man? What is our purpose here in life? What are we here for? What is life about? What is our number one reason for being here on the earth? The answer is the chief end of man is to glorify God, to worship God, and to enjoy him forever, to delight in him forever. That's why we're here. We are here to worship the Lord, and he will not share this glory. He will not share this place in our hearts with anyone or anything. He will not scooch over on his throne to make room for someone or something else. And yes, I know that's very narrow-minded. I know that's exclusive and all kinds of other words that have a bad connotation here today. But the truth is, no other God created us and knit us together in our mother's wombs and then took on flesh and lived and died and rose again from the dead so that we would be forgiven and freed. So not to us, not to us, but to God alone be the glory. And when we worship this way, when we worship the Lord, and I mean really worship, when we really mean it, when we say not to us, not to us, but to the Lord, then we become godly. Now, let me be very clear here. I'm not saying we become godlike. I'm not saying we become God. I'm saying we become godly kinds of people. Notice what the psalm says. We worship him for the sake of his steadfast love and faithfulness. Those are two of the key attributes that God revealed about himself when he first gave his name for the first time to Moses. He said, he is the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And so when we worship him, when we give ourselves to him, when God truly is our delight and our number one, when we look forward to spending time in worship and in prayer, when we look forward to studying the scriptures, when we look forward to living lives where we shine his light so other people can know about him, when we are excited about living for the Lord, then we will become merciful people, gracious people, people who are slow to anger, people who are abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, for we will choose to live the way he calls us to live. We will become like the God we worship. And we see this in our second reading from Proverbs where the author tells us how to live wise lives for the Lord. When they, he says, let not steadfast love and faithfulness, there it is again, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind that around your neck so you always have it with you. Write it on the tablet of your heart so it becomes a part of who you are. You will then find favor and good success in the eyes of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. It's tempting, but don't do that. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord. There we are again. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing to your flesh and a refreshment to your bones. Any of you here need a refreshment to your bones today? There's how you get it. We become like what we worship. And when we worship God, 
we become godly people, just as those teenagers, if they're left to their own devices, will slowly become more and more like the celebrities that they idolize, we slowly become more and more like Jesus Christ. And the rest of the world doesn't get it. And the other nations didn't get it in ancient Israel either. We see mockery recorded in the psalm here. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does as he pleases. The other nations didn't understand Israel because Israel did not have any visual representation of God when they worshiped. All the other nations had an idol or a statue or an image or a picture or something that they could look at and see while they worshiped. Israel famously did not because it was forbidden in the second commandment. God doesn't allow any visual representations of himself, no pictures, no statues, no images, because he knows whatever we craft to be a representation of him is going to end up an idol, right? Whatever image we draw, whatever we put in stained glass, whatever statue we carve, it's going to end up looking a lot more like us than God. And Presbyterians have historically taken this commandment very seriously. That's why if you walk into most any Presbyterian sanctuary, you will find usually a very stark, simple, decoration. You will not find an image of God or Jesus in stained glass. If you do, it's a rarity because it violates the second commandment. And Psalm 115 helps us understand why God takes this so seriously. He says those other nations who worship those idols and images, their idols are silver and gold. They're the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have noses, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they don't feel. Feet, but they don't walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. And here's the key. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. When you worship a God that has a mouth but cannot speak to his people, cannot give guidance, cannot give encouragement, cannot make a covenant. When you worship a God that has eyes but can't watch over you in protection, when you worship a God who has ears but cannot hear you when you pray, a God who has hands but has no power to help you, a God who has feet but cannot walk with you in your lives, then you begin to lose your spiritual senses. And as one author has written, you become blind to the light and you become deaf to God's voice. When you worship a lifeless thing, when you live for money or power or something like that, then you lose life in all of its abundance and all of its blessing, and you become like what you worship. So the question we all need to ask ourselves today is, what do we worship? What is it that excites us? What do we want to give our time to, our energy, our money? What rouses us? What energizes us? What do we look forward to? Is it God whom we worship and serve? Is it God, the one who spun the planets in their orbit? God who came up with the whole idea of waterfalls and islands and whales and fish and slugs and slime molds and all of the wonders of creation? Is it the God who knit us together in our mother's wombs, the God who numbered all of the hairs on our head, the God who numbered each one of our days before one of them came to be? Is it God, the one whose steadfast love never ceases, whose mercies never come to an end? Is it God, our shepherd, who will leave the 99 
to go and search us out when we get lost and when he finds us, will pick us up and lay us on his shoulders and bring us back to the flock so we can be safe and cared for again. Is it the God who took on flesh, our flesh, lived a full human life except for sin, who God who was nailed to a rough wooden cross pouring out his blood for our sins? Is it the God who on the third day rose again from the dead and who promises that if we are in him, one day we also will rise as he did with a new resurrection body to spend eternity with him? Is this the God who excites us? Is this the God whom we worship? Is this the God who is a healing to our flesh and a refreshment to our bones? Or do we instead get really excited by somebody who can kick a ball really well? Or who has exceptional skill in playing the guitar? Or do we get excited by the thought of having more and more and more and more money in the bank so we can buy whatever we want whenever we want and so we can feel safe in this crazy world that we're living in and when we don't know what's going to happen next? Or do we get excited by another person and we want to live our lives completely and totally for them a spouse, a lover, a child, a grandchild, a friend. What will happen when that person is gone? Folks, Scripture tells us if we worship anyone or anything other than God himself, then we are worshiping a lesser deity. And since we become like what we worship, then that means we will live a lesser life. When we turn away from the Lord and giver of life, we turn away from the blessings that he wants to give to us. So let us be wise in our living. Let us say and let us truly mean not to us, not to us, but to God's name be the glory. And let us trust in him with our whole heart. Let's not lean on our own understanding, but instead in all of our ways, let's acknowledge him so he can make our paths straight. Let us bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And therefore, let us become the godly people he wants us to be so we can bring him glory. For the heavens belong to him, we belong to him, and he is worthy of all that we have to give. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To him alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you are God. We thank you that we are not God. We thank you that you give us wisdom so that we may live our lives for you. Help us, Lord, to worship you and you alone each and every day, and help us to become the godly people you want us to become. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.